Welcome to this FAIN online event. My name is Samantha Harvey and I'm here with Paul Lynch to talk about his novel Prophet Song, which has just won the Booker Prize 2023. Um, Paul is the author of five novels, uh, Red Sky and Morning, The Black Snow, Grace, Beyond the Sea, and now Prophet Song. And his previous novels have been long and shortlisted and won pretty much every French prize going. <laughs> um, he has also been shortlisted for the Walter Scott Prize and won the Kerry Group Irish Novel of the Year for Grace. Um, welcome, Paul. Thanks, Samantha. It's a pleasure to be here. So I want to ask you first, I suppose inevitably, about uh, winning the Booker. We spoke probably a couple of months ago before Prophet Song came out and we were talking about prizes and the the kind of uh, poison chalice of them, the, the sort of terrible curse and the terrible blessing that is prizes. And we were saying, when well, you were saying back then that you, uh, that all writers need a boost to their serotonin levels from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> How are your serotonin levels now? Oh my gosh, uh, baby's got the bends. I think, as Tom York famously said, um, uh, it's 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 heady, it's heady stuff. Um, you know, you you're so right about book prizes that 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 you know you find yourself when your book's published, you're sort of hoping that you you'll be up there on race day, but at the same time, it, it's 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 so it's there's nothing that you can do, do you know, like to control any of it or, you know, an athlete goes out and an athlete trains really hard and then there's the race and they run against time. But a writer, the book's already written. So there's just nothing you can do. And when you are shortlisted or longlisted or whatever it is, you're, you're full of the energy of, of a race, but you can't run. So yeah. sometimes, sometimes I think of it, you know, of it's almost a Monty Python-esque kind of situation where the starter guns fired and we are all doing chicken dances and strange strange shapes and we're just doing our own thing and uh and we're judged according to to how how, how strange or wonderful we are um yeah, yeah. i love that uh, that that image yeah of we we just filled with the adrenaline of the race but with no way of burning that adrenaline off because yeah before yeah. you run our race it's done yeah and you know when when we were longlisted and then shortlisted paul murray my friend and irish fellow irish writer who was shortlisted he said, what, what are we supposed to do with all this? It's going on for two months now. You know, he said, there's no there's no possibility of writing. There's no possibility of getting any work done because the world is just coming at you all the time. Um, and, and so I had actually sort of, I had made my peace with, with not winning it and had decided that I would certainly from the end of Christmas just, just get back to work. That was the goal. Um, but, you know, I've been told that, not to, that's just not going to happen now. Um, so no, I think you probably won't get back to writing for a good year yet. I think a year is is what I, yeah around then. But at that point, I will pull the shutters down, and there'll be a key thrown out the window, and Paul Lynch will go into silent mode. You know, I suppose just to, to quickly before we move on to talking about Prophet Song, that I'm interested in that relationship between. I always think of it as the relationship between being a writer and being an author. You know the the writer sits here, writes. The author is the one who, uh, in 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 a best case scenario, wins the Booker Prize and has to do all of this stuff. And what's the for you? What's the relationship between those? And which do you, um, how do you manage now having to be an author full time and not a writer at all? It's a great question. You know, when we become writers, we do so because we figured out that there's something far deeper within, inside us that needs to be channeled. And you you could call that your authenticity for a start. There's many things that you can call it, but that inner voice comes from the deepest, truest, most authentic aspect of self. So when, 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 when we sit down, when you sit down, I know we've talked about this ourselves. We are truly inhabited, um, are, are inhabiting our best selves. And when you lose that or when you're not able to write well we become cranky we, you know we've become difficult because that's actually because we, we are suddenly alienated from from the thing that makes us most at home in the self and 
when you are a writer and, and, and you switch into public mode, your polarity is completely reversed. It's completely and utterly um, reversed. And it's not that you wear a mask. I, I wouldn't describe it as such um, that there's our persona, though I have seen many very famous writers, they do have personas and they do become the mask. And I'm aware, you know, fa fa you know, celebrity or fame it is a mask that eats the face. And um, that's that's something I'm deeply aware of and um uh, and I'm protective of you know like that 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 self that's here that 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 writes these books I have to figure out how to how 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 to protect that self and uh, but also to listen to it in times when 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 the world is knocking at the door you know yesterday I had the notebook out and I was just just grabbing grabbing downloading a few small things and I feel like I've achieved something then you know it's when it's when you're when you're when, when you're extremely busy, um, that self goes quiet because because it cannot be heard to speak, and that's that that's when the trouble starts for 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 a writer. Yeah, I completely get that. Yeah, yeah, it's the same for you, isn't it? Well, to a much lesser degree, but yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. I I like what you said about having to protect that that writer, that self that writes that sits quietly writing, somewhat impervious to the world. Um, at least to the opinions of the world, the judgments. And here you are, you know, sitting right in the, the kind of glare of judgment, trying to go, you, you just have to ride that way for now, I suppose. But but at some point you have to get back to yourself, which, and your writing self, which is, um, has nothing to do with that that world, I think. I love that, it's got nothing to do with it. You, it's, you, you know, it, it, that writing world, that self, it's 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 it comes from a timeless place inside you. That's the, the, the way I can the only way I can think of it. It's timeless. It's placeless. It's it's egoless. It's you know it's the eye. It's yeah. the it's, it's the third eye. And um, I think that the the religious mystics, I think the Buddhists, I think the um, many different. Uh, the transcendentalists, the so many different traditions have all arrived at the same thing. They just do it in, in they just interpret it in different ways, and 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 all artists are, are have been arriving at it too. And um, this 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 aspect of of mind is once you cultivate it, once you cultivate it, it becomes essential. Um, and but and and the, the, it requires the highest amount of of scrutiny and daily practice to maintain it um because 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 it 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 gets it gets lost in the noise it it it, it cannot speak when 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 we're in the sort of tyranny of the now i think that that sort of segues to something i wanted to ask you about prophet song and the writing of it because i know that you meditate daily um I don't know if you're still finding time for that now, but I know that's been a practice in your life for a long time. And when I was rereading Prophet Song, it kind of struck me the quality of sustained attention in the book, in the in the the care for its sentences, but in this kind of quite metronomic, uh, rhythmic way in which the book unfolds with this absolute attention to its proposition and even though the book is dark and disturbing there's something about it which is incredibly centered and meditative as well in in the way it focuses completely on its subject and I don't know if this is something that you can even speak to because it might just be my own observation about it but is there you know, do you feel there is a relationship there between your practice and your writing, and particularly um, your writing of Prophet Song, your practice of meditation? Yeah. I should say. I, I, I think you're right. Um, I mean, they're, they're 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 deeply connected. In what way, though? Can I articulate it? It's it's interesting to try and do so. I mean, writing is always rationalization. We all, as writers, we always rationalize after the fact. You know, but what happens between betwixt the pen and the page is 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 a mystery. Um, and yet we do know certain things, all writers, we spend our days watching our minds, we spend our days living, living up alongside this subconscious aspect of the self. And so we get ideas about it. And Virginia Woolf said that 
style style is rhythm and, and you know and 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 that rhythm isn't isn't just a sort of a, a, a pat a pattern on the page it's actually an imprint from the psyche there's something built into that and so the fall of the words is is a kind of an energy a melody a cadence that's coming from very deep within and I'm aware of that when I'm writing, but I'm also not aware of it. You know, I'm perhaps I'm I'm steering it, but what I'm looking for is that feeling of 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 cadence, of song, of 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 energy, of momentum. You know, I, I, that that in this book, but in particular, it was really important that the language lull the reader, just pull them in into this 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 alternative space. And and that the sentences were always seeking to sort of capture the now in some kind of way, because you know I realized that 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 people would think of this book as as dystopian or speculative, and and I I have this sort of it's not that I'm against these forms, it's just that I just I you know as Paul Harding on the train going back to London last week said he said all novels are a genre of one. I'm interested in moving past these labels; they're, they're sort of meaningless to me. And 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 the dystopian often comes with certain expectations, and it's often to me it seems almost not paper, just almost papier mâché. Like it's like you can you can see how it was wired together, and whereas in this book there are like long sentences, and and those sentences are just sort of adding a depth of realism. They're 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 they're, they're sort of exploding the form a little bit of of what might be dystopian by by actually making it the now by making it by allowing the reader to truly inhabit this space that the reader is in, this space that Eilish is in, this consciousness that that is that is on the page to come into those moments. So those, you know, those moments of being were in there with her. And, and at the same time, the sentences are also articulating the rolling sense of inevitability of, of, of events that are just careering onward, moving way beyond the powers of Eilish to control. And so, so those, the, 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 you know, the rhythm is, 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 is the first stone that I put down, you know, as part of, as part of that. Yeah. This, this absolute presence in the sentences that each sentence is on the brink. It's on the precipice of the moment. And we are tipping over the edge with, with Eilish, with each sentence. You know, I think that makes it, it makes it a very breathless, vertiginous, powerful read, as I'm sure many people have pointed out to you. Um, I suppose for anyone who has been recently living on Saturn or something, could you, it might be worth saying uh, just very briefly what the book is about. Yeah. Um, and maybe particularly in relation to its title, because we've actually never spoken about this. And I um, wondered if you could talk about the title Prophet Song and what why why it's called that and, and what how that relates to the book yeah I mean the, the novel is the story of Ailey Stark who is a mother of four she's got three teenagers and an infant she's a scientist um she's married to to Larry Stack who works for the Teachers Union of Ireland so he's a trade unionist and you know the book opens in an Ireland that is ostensibly the Ireland of now I don't say in the book if it's set in the near future or or a counterfactual present. I, it's not stated. It's left open, and there's a reason for that. And, and I might come back to it if, if if. But the the you know, Ireland is 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 there are just subtle changes occurring. There's a populist government has been elected, and um, there's a the democratic norms are beginning to slide, and the media is starting to be curbed a little bit. And Larry Stack, there's Larry Stack. The book opens with with a knock on the door, and the Garden National Services Bureau, who are the Ireland's newly formed uh, secret police, have come and they want to speak to Larry. And he's not at home. And when they finally meet, get him, he goes in to see them, and he's asked to prove that his actions, his, his intention to march and to organise a march as as a leader of the TUI, as a senior member, are not seditious to the state. And if you've been living in a uh, a liberal democracy all your life that's an extraordinarily counterintuitive thing to have to process and so the, the, that's the, the, that's that's the sort of background to the book and but really the book is an unraveling 
that's that's what it is that's you know it's the unraveling of a, of the known world into the unknown into the abyss into you know in, into a labyrinth i suppose because Ailish is moving through the labyrinth all you know throughout this book and she's trying to keep her family together trying to outmaneuver these forces that are just far beyond her capacity to understand or to see um and the title prophet song i mean early on i some people thought that it was in, that i was sort of being prophetic that i was trying to say this is what's going to come to pass and that that's not the intention at all that the meaning of the book lies in 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 a there's a there's a page toward towards the end where Eilish has this moment of 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 an epiphany of recognition that that the end of the world is not some sudden event you know it's not a biblical apocalypse it's actually occurring over and over and over again throughout history that it comes to your it knocks on your door it comes to your town it comes to your city and it and and it's your world that ends and but not for somebody else and so it becomes this distant event an event on the news that you watch on your TV, uh, something that passes into rumor, something that passes into myth, and that what we're living um, is what we're living through. What she's living through is 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 something that's just eternally recurrent. It seems to be built into what we are as human beings, and that was one of the reasons why this book operates in a space that that allows the mythic in. You know that that it doesn't specify. The political nature of what's going on in the background because to do that would be to make the book about that politics people would zone in on that oh this book is about that politics and it is this message and instead i've turned it inside out and so i foregrounded the personal cost of events and i foregrounded just the the the, the, heart, the feeling of being alive the feeling of of living through this rather than what it is or how we're to interpret it and um and, and and so the mythic enters into it by all, just all sorts of ways it enters into the book um it, you know the, the the closer you can get to myth the more freight the more universal freight your story can carry it it, it can it can speak to multiple political realities and i realized i was writing this book that it was able to do that that it was starting to sort of you know, I'd started off writing from one place, but it kind of grew and, and and deepened. And I and and uh and you know, and I was thinking about a line from Cormac McCarthy's The Crossing that I had notebook many years ago. And if I'm if I, hopefully I won't get this wrong now, the line was something like, you know, the task of the narrator it uh, appears it isn't an easy one. He appears to be required to choose his tale from among the many that are possible, but that is not the case. Instead, he's required to make many of the one. And this book, I was trying to make many of the one. And so to to allow myth in, to allow that space where Eilish sort of has these moments where she sees how timeless her situation is, how, how across time there's so many people have viewed, have seen the same thing that she's seen. They've seen smoke rising up from, from, from the city that they're in, the, the oncoming signals of war um, or, 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 or the oncoming sense of loss that 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 that's coming to meet her um yeah yeah that's all so um beautifully um powerfully put because you know i've read uh, a few uh write-ups on the book that talk about its prescience for example and i always think that's a, a slightly strange word to apply to this book because it kind of infers that what you're doing is predicting that this thing is going to happen or could happen in Ireland or in a Western democracy when in fact that's sort of it's it's not prescient because it's talking about the repetition the circularity of these events the way they keep recurring over and over again for for people across the world as you say something that's in the news suddenly becomes one's reality and there's this circularity to that so it's not trying to predict the future it's saying the future is always here and it's also the past and it's also the present and there's this uh this repetition there's nothing new under the sun as you as you say in your epigraph 
Um, and I, I've, and that that permeates the book all the way through. There are so many allusions to that, to the to the way things just keep recurring and repeating, and and that um, Ailish is in this this timeless story. And simultaneous to that, you've got this really interesting thing happening whereby the chronology of the book itself, whilst also pointing to the timelessness of time and the, the kind of um, simultaneous presence of different time frames, is it, it's an entirely chronological book. And it, and it has this very rhythmic forward motion, a, a very simple, effective, powerful chronology that takes the reader through from beginning to end through the seasons. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that decision to sort of play it so straight, to play it so chronologically, and also maybe more importantly, how you came to decide upon the time frame for this book. How long does it take for a society <laughs> to collapse into totalitarianism? How many seasons? You know, what, what was the rationale behind your the, the, the right. time frame of the book? Well, there's some serious slate of hand going on here, um, which I'm going to I'm going to fess up now, um, because I made use of. I'm sure there's a better term for this, but I call it Shakespearean double time. If you notice in so many of his plays that that the actual time frame for the shaping of the events is much longer than the time frame in the novel. So the in the foreground, events unfold. And wars come, and 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 you know that uh, you know it, everything develops on stage at a completely natural pace. But it but it it is it's completely unnatural. It, it it's not possible for events to to unfold. Like Richard the Third could not unfold in the manner that it does in real life. So there's this enormous sense of compression layered onto the actual time frame it takes for it to occur. And I borrowed that for this book. I found myself doing that, 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 that was, you know, it's, 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 it's slate of hand that it's really, it feels like a year in this book, but, but it couldn't, maybe it couldn't be a year, you know, maybe two years you could see this happening or, you know, maybe a little bit longer. Um, but so that's, that's, that, that's what I'm doing here. And, and nobody's noticed, you've noticed, um, which I, which I'm very impressed by. Um, <laughs> but I'm not surprised, Sam, I'm not surprised at all. Um, when I say nobody's noticed. Nobody said it to me yet. Um, you're, you're you're the first person to say it to me. But um, but you know, I, I did think about the, the linearity of the book is really important. Um, and I realized early on when I was writing the book, I knew the last line of the book, which I won't say as because it's a spoiler. But I thought once I once I'd settled on that last line, it just it, that line went into me, inhabited me, and I knew I had to prove that line true that it's a QED. And so. I realized that the book had to be constructed sentence by sentence, like a series of equations. This because of this, because of this, because of this, because of this, and on it goes, a causal chain of events. And that 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 series of equations or chain of events developed a, a sort of it, its own rules about truth, its own rules about what I could and could not do. So as writers, we often, we have fancy, we have novelistic fancy, I think to myself sometimes, oh, I'd like to try that. Maybe it'd be fun if Eilish could could do this particular type of thing. And the book just said no. And anytime I would veer outside of, of that logic of truth, the book would just say to me, no. And so I learned to respect it. I learned to listen to it. But it took me up to a point where the second last chapter, where, where the book becomes truly profoundly dark. I couldn't write it. I froze. I I I looked at what it was that that I had to do, and I balked at it for a little while, and maybe for two or three months, I found myself unsure how to do it, afraid to do it, afraid to go there as a, as just for myself, because if I go there, I have to feel it for the reader to feel it. I have to feel it, but afraid to go there for the reader too, and 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 these are the risks you take as a writer. You you know I I I you're not alive on the page unless you're pushing past yourself and going to dangerous places. And I realized, you know, like 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 Ver like Dante's Virgil, the poet has to sort of guide, take the reader by the hand and do so with with a little bit of poetry and a little bit of grace. So that when they hold that Medusa, that mirror up, 
the reader can see the Medusa through the mirror, through 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 that through that through the writer's mirror. They they themselves are unharmed. You know that the that the reader can stare into the abyss, so to speak, and not fall in. Mm-hmm. And that's what I what I realized I had to do. And and so and also I I also realized that that the re, that it, that by sticking tr- to the truth in the book that the readers would respect that they would know that I had not foisted something upon them that I had not was not acting in a you know a, a, as a provocation or that I was not writing against something I was writing towards something I was writing into the unknown but directed there by truth and that and that and that I would gain the readers trust by doing that yeah i mean and i think you know something that that i felt while reading the book what really came across strongly for me and i think must have for a lot of readers is this idea of justice and that we have a sense that justice will prevail there are laws and they will protect us and there's a logic to that and your your narrative is going counter to that logic because it's saying that laws are only going to protect us as long as they're there you can just undo a law you know it's a it's a it's an agreement that we can uh, we can stop agreeing upon and so this this momentum of the book to follow what you've been describing is that you know the the inevitable logic of it even though it goes against any impulse in us for a more redemptive logic that says oh yeah but that can't happen because there's a law to prevent that or somebody will step in to save them something will happen and it doesn't happen and and it instead of in the book that being a uh, a frustration for the reader it's this kind of systematic undoing of our expectations as readers and our desires and our need for redemption it's very daring I think, in it in its um in its focus on doing yeah. that yeah i mean in some ways we could call this the problem of the real couldn't we you know that that we wake up every day and we get out of bed and the reason we're able to get out of bed is because we don't actually look the real in the eye and if we did look what was real in the eye we we you know you might just turn your phone off and just hide under the hide under the covers um and 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 just be done with it all and so we're we're wired towards optimism we are wired almost to think that that history is teleological that's moving to some sort of ideal future um you know i certainly think there's a bias within the last 50 60 years of liberal democracy that we're we're moving to some sort of ideal of rationality which is really dangerous because we are deeply irrational and that it's that irrationality that society cannot see we don't even see it in ourselves it is genuinely a blind spot i think if we were to watch you if you just spend a day and watch yourself watch how you tell yourself one thing and then do the complete opposite two minutes later and just keep it just watch this for a day you'll realize you know that human beings are defined by rampant irrationality and so in this book um Eilish's father simon who is was a scientist and has dementia and is you know the past is sliding away the, the past that was known he says to Eilish, you know that 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 they're taking ownership of the institutions and when you take ownership of the institutions you you can you can change the narrative and when you change the narrative you're taking ownership of what people perceive to be real and so they're muddying the real they're 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 playing games with it and we're living in a world now where that's occurring we're seeing that occur we can no longer truly agree on a on a sort of consensus reality of of where we're all at anymore and so the book is poking at this stuff it's 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 sort of examining how we move through the world full of biases and yet the world just does not give a damn the world around us is implacable and silent and we are truly alienated from it and there are metaphysical laws or or laws of, of 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 perhaps human truth that we keep missing, we 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 keep not understanding it about ourselves, and 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 it goes back to getting out of bed in the morning. But it's but 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 it, but we do so at 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 our at, at to enormous cost. And yeah, I mean, so that that's why often when I say that this book isn't political. I mean, obviously there's 
the book has arrived at a place that can be read as a political book and it seems to have arrived at, it seems to have moral weight but my chief concerns are things that we're talking about here these are metaphysical ideas you know and, and you know to me political fiction often starts out from the point of knowing its own answer and it's seeking to change something that can be changed and so that makes it about grievance and I, I, it, it's my personal belief as a writer that serious fiction should only be about grief. The things that, that cannot be changed, the things that are lost, the things that lie beyond us, the things that cannot be comprehended. You know, it, it, just the fact that life is lived in the labyrinth, the fact that the unwanted likes to knock on our door and that we are constantly found out throughout our lives um, by these things, that we are constantly... We are constantly encountering the sort of the unknown and 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 things that just truly lie beyond us. And 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 this is what I'm interested in. This is this is why I get out of bed in the morning. Mm. Yeah, it comes across so strongly in the book. I agree with you entirely. It's much more a metaphysical book for me as well than it is political. I wonder if it's time a good time now to do a short reading, Paul. Sure. Um, I'm going to read a very political section. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, it's just a sequence later in the book where we are in the unraveling and Dublin is is subject to the movements of civil war and it, the street that Adish lives on is now occupied by the defence forces and here we um, yeah so in the afternoon she sits by the bedroom window waiting for a detailed report on the BBC while Ben naps in the cot. The news comes on and she turns it off, shaking with rage, thinking, this is not the news. This is not the news at all. The news is the civilian watching the soldier outside her home as he lolls on a sandbag playing with his phone. The news is the assault rifle resting against the sandbag. It is the soldier's laughing mouth. It is the fast food wrappers and coffee cups strewn about the asphalt. It is the retired couple from up the street who have decided that they want to go. The news is their quarrel in the driveway. It is the woman flapping her hands about why not, what cannot be taken in the car. It is the husband who shuts his face to his wife. It is the black bag the woman holds in her arms like a child. It is what is inside the bag. The news is the entire contents of the car. It is the boot the man has to sit closed. The news is the driveway gated for the last time. The house dark at night. It is the traffic light stuck on red for a week before it goes dark. It is the car that will not be allowed through the checkpoint. The news is the shrinking air on the streets. It is the shuttered shops. The windows ply boarded. It is the horse dogs whooping throughout the night. It is the eldest son who does not call anymore because it's too risky to call and nobody knows if he is dead or alive. She watches an army officer riding down the street on a nodding black horse, the build of the thing. She thinks it is a Frisian sport horse, the rider's hands quiet on his lap, his dark boots gleaming to the knee. How he moves within some serene and regal bearing as though he were but an emissary of the law of force. The soldiers at the checkpoint come to standing and the officer does not dismount, but waves his crop as though casting incantations into the air. She watches the horse rotate an ear without turning its head. It is listening, it seems, to something beyond the uneasy stillness, the whisperings of a tall conifer, the radiation from the sun upon its leaves. It could hear the death that waits with open arms all over the city, the death that waits to be let drop from the sky. Wow. The news is the the traffic light that's stuck on red for a week before it goes dark. I love that. Um, I want to ask what's possibly a ridiculous question. It might be a very mundane question, so if you don't want to answer it, just let's pretend it didn't happen. Um, it struck me reading the book again about this idea of uh, expediency when you're writing novels, 
that you don't have more characters than you need, for example. I wondered, why does Ailish have four children? <laughs> seems like that's quite a lot of crowd control you've got to do. It seems absolutely right that she has four children. But I'm so, if I was thinking if I wrote this book, I'm, I'd give her one at most. I wouldn't want to bother with, with four. Um, and yet it works. And I, I don't know whether there's something in this question that's interesting for you to ask. Oh, there is. There is. There absolutely is. Absolutely. And really it boils down to what I consider complexity. Because what this book is chasing is, among the many things that it's chasing, is also the problem of complexity. I think that when we think about events like this on the news, when we watch them and we and, and there's always that failure of imagination, there's always that failure of us to truly understand, not even empathize, but just understand how it is for people, you know, in, in, in these kind of events. That we're that we're sort of inured to what we watch. And 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 the fiction in this book is designed to get past those self-defenses. And one of the ways of doing that is to truly deepen the complexity of Elish Stack's life to the point that we're in what I what I call high resolution gray. And that 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 her world is truly enmeshed and that she has three teenagers who have to who she has to help navigate this world, that that this world where their father has been disappeared. She has an infant child to to a surprise who's come along the way to 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 deal with. She has her father who is sliding into dementia. She has her sister in Canada who is talking to her and saying, Eilish, it's time to leave. History is a silent record of those who did not know when to leave. And Eilish says, it's all well and good for you to say that. But Eilish, uh, you know, but Molly is, you know, in, in, in their team is, is, is doing so well in the league. And Larry is, you know, I'm dealing, trying to get Larry back. And what if dad falls and breaks a hip, what then? And, and, and so what I've learned writing this book is just how truly embedded and meshed we are in our lives. Our, we define ourselves by our relationships. We define, we define ourselves by the place that we live in, by our career. All these things are, are, what we, are, are who we are. And that nobody actually willingly leaves this behind. That for you to take that decision to leave and become a refugee, for example, those things, all of them have to be unplugged one after another, after another, after another, until your life is shut down and then you're shunted out. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it comes back to this, um, as you say, the high resolution realism of the individual lives that are at stake here, that are at the center of the novel as against the background, the political background, which you have made universal and mythic, almost, almost allegorical. Yeah. And the contrast between that stark, complex, inconvenient realism of the lives of your, your characters, and the fact that it would be much easier if Ailish had no children or just one child. But in fact, she has four because people with four children also fall prey to totalitarianism yeah yeah um, you know i think that's that's a really um i hadn't kind of seen it like that before but that's that's very powerful and she also you know like she also has to contend with their with their individual traumas their their responses mm -hmm. to trauma which i'm really interested in and how each one of them you know watches the known world fall away and 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 and, and responds to it in a completely different way her eldest son Mark becomes radicalized. That's his response. He becomes yeah. radicalized and 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 leaves against her wishes, and she loses him that way. And Molly just starts to shut down inside, and and Bailey turns against her because she tells him a lie at the start. She 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 hides from him the fact that his father has been you know gobbled by the state. I think is how she puts it. You know to somebody else that that she thinks he's too young to understand because he's 12 and she's trying to protect him. But actually what she's done is she's actually shut him out and he doesn't forgive her. And that sets then this, that sets off then this chain of really of antagonistic energy between them that, that sort of 
in some way, in a very tiny way, leads leads to what happens. And and so I'm interested in in our responses to trauma and, and how we process the unspeakable and how children process it. And there's a moment where she's they're hiding under the stairs, and you know, there are airstrikes. And she realizes this infant child in her arms is absorbing from her her fear, that this fear is going into his body. And he will never remember what's happened. He will never recall his father. He will never, never sort of have any living memory of what he's experienced. But his body will know. His body will carry this energy in him. And he will become a damaged man. And how he will go forward in his life. And things will own him. He will find himself doing things in response to energies that he has no knowledge of inside him. And so this sort of the energy of or, or not the energy, but the, but the sort of traumatic energy of what's being imposed on these characters is vast. And it it this is this is where, you know, that the, the suggestion of inter intergenerational trauma begins to sort of it's just there. It's under the line, but it's you know, it's under the line. Mm, yeah. There are two really striking images in the book. Well, there are lots, but there are two that, that really um, resonated with me. One is the moth that leaves the mouth of the, the guard, the police officer, but near the beginning um, when he's speaking to Larry. Um, the other is the blue horse, which recurs a couple of times. Could you speak a little bit about those those images because um, they seem to me oh, they, you know they they left a mark on me. I mean, in and of themselves, just su such powerful images, and they also took the book into a slightly different terrain for me, into a, a slightly more allegorical terrain. Although you're pointing at something beyond the words on the page, and. Um, I'm really intrigued by them and I would love to hear you talk about them. Yeah. I mean, when I teach fiction, I always tell the students to, to, to really pay attention to the images that come to you from, 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 from the muse, that the images are really your, your treasure. The images are, are there to be unpacked because they have come down from your unconscious, your subconscious, your super conscious, if you want to call it, um, and 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 they are dense with meaning. And when you're writing, you really got to chase those images, and you got to hold on to them when they come to you. And those are those those are images that 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 just came to me. And I would say, at least on the surface, you know, where that line of you know how it seems, I think it says it seems as if the moth comes from his mouth. And we are now at a point where. The, just the known is the unknown. We're it's not it's, it's like it's like a dream reality. We're in this liminal space where we're trying to truly understand now what's what's real and what's not real. Are we in are we in dream? Are we in the place of dream? Are we or are we in the real? And the the, the blue horse comes from a dream that Elish has, where she finds herself in, imprisoned in this moment of time. She's like. She finds that their sense of freedom or even at a deeper level, free will is becoming truly imposed upon, truly, truly curtailed. And she has this dream of of being on a horse on a beach. It's a memory. It's it's a it's a dream memory. It's it's something that that she did perhaps as a child and it comes to her and it has it has meaning to her. It has Perhaps on one surface level, it's it's freedom. It's it's that's sort of the unfettered life um, of being a child on on a ho riding a horse on a beach by the sea. And of course, it circles back. It circles back later, and we're in, you know, in I think it's night or or certainly it's very very early dawn, probably touching the blue hour, and and she sees the ho she sees the horse again. And and that she sees that horse, that horse is real, but it's 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 a circular symbol. And so I mean, I'm sure if I thought further into this stuff, I could unpack them for you, but that that I'd be I'd be doing the readers a disservice. Yeah, yeah, because they're there to be available to the readers as well to resonate as they do. Yeah. yeah. 
I we, I could I could talk to you all day about this, Paul, but we only have time for one more question. So I, I want to just quote a line from the book, um, it, which comes um, in a section where they go, people go to try to register or, or find out information about their missing loved ones who they think have been taken by the state. And you write, all of them brought here by love. Sooner or later, pain becomes too great for fear. And when people's fear is gone, the regime will have to go. I, I sort of sat back when I read that line and um, thought, oh, I wonder if that's true. You know, is that, does, does, does love in the end and, and people's inability to tolerate any more pain overcome their fear and make people rise up? Is it something that you believe? Do you think Elish believes it by the end of the novel? I think that Elish believes it in that instance. Mm. Um, does she believe it at the end? Uh, I mean... I don't know. I, I think that I think that there are values that are in that sort of eternal time space that do hold true. But the problem is is that they remain inaccessible for periods of time that are often just too long. Mm. And there's a, there's another line later in the book um, where um, um, about pity. Um, and how pity pity turns into love, and I think that's true. But 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 I think it takes time. I think that it takes much longer than the time frame of the events in this book. I think that when things begin to unravel, the damn thing takes on an energy of its own, and it's generally unstoppable. But what happens in the restoration is that these values are returned to us. And in the restoration lies the foundation with which we can build peace again. And we have come through um, post-World War II, you know, 80, 80 years of, 80 plus years of, nearly 80 years of, 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 of peace. And that restoration is now, I think, in as a writer, what I sense in the world is unraveling. Mm. And my fear, as a citizen, is can this be stopped? Um, and I may be wrong about that. And uh, I'm very, I'd be delighted if I'm wrong. Um, it would, it would, you know, it would, it would make me very happy for my children and their future that I'm wrong. But that's what I sense as a writer, uh, and I can't, I can't turn that off. Yeah, yeah, and I think. A lot of people sense the same. I certainly do, and and I guess uh, that's evidenced in some way by the success of Prophet Song and the fact that it is such a dark book and yet resonates so resoundingly with so many people. Um, that, you know, it, it suggests that there is a lot of shared fear around this, yeah. um, and the the book gives form to that, but also gives not not hope or optimism but but a, a kind of metaphysical uh perspective or clarity to that which i and i think is uh you know perhaps very much needed at the moment yeah and I, i'll just add before we finish that i think a lot of people are starting to sense something that's kind of in kuwait but it's there and this book is tapping into this particular energy or this conversation which is that we've been living for much of the 20th century and into this century with the belief that the society that we've created can solve all the problems that we have and that we, we you know we, we we sup on one kool-aid after another whether it's um you know um whether it's uh totalitarianism or communism or or, or consumerism or um whatever ism you want to add that, that that different societies around the world try out for a period of time and then discover that they're not happy, and and that um, and that um, we're now in the information technology uh, period where we think that that's going to solve all our problems. And 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 but the things that I'm talking about in this book are problems that actually lie outside of 
society, the problems of the spirit. And and there are like, I suppose there are almost religious questions that can't be solved by religion because so many of us don't have religion anymore. And that I, I think the place I'm coming from a writer is 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 trying to answer or speak, not answer, it's just to pose questions about this, this issue of what lies outside society cannot be solved by society. It has to be solved by something else. And I'm not sure what, what the answers are to that, but the questions are really important. And I think that we've been in a stupor for a long time. And 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 maybe there's this, maybe, maybe I think my sense is there's a lot of us are starting to wake up about what what is it that that we find ourselves imprisoned in. And and that comes back to that knock on the door at the beginning of the novel, which is a sort of wake up, you know, everybody yeah. wake up. Wake up. Thank you so much, Paul. This has been, uh, I, you know, I, I've read this book a couple of times. We've talked about it before, but it's uh, it just keeps sort of opening itself more and more to to ideas and discussions. So thank you for being so wonderfully generous with your answers. No, thank you, Samantha, for um for 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 your truly truly insightful questions uh, it's it's a, it's always a pleasure for me when we meet because our conversations when you know when, when we're not being recorded our conversations just go off into extraordinary places because because you have you have a you have a beautiful mind so it's 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 uh, it's a real pleasure to be to be to do this chat with you thank you good luck with everything that happens in the next year <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs>